session looks good. Probably not. Water towers fly! They go down phenomenal. Why do you not play a dog? Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these. All right, folks. I'm giving you that apprehensive look at the beginning of the stream where I hope that everything's working because it's my fault if it's not. John Galloway for NASA Space Flight here. Let me know if you can hear me and also see me. We normally don't say that, but uh, see me today because it's time for another exciting episode of NSF Live, our weekly show that we do every Sunday at... 3-ish p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard slash Daylight Time, where we talk about the space news that's happened this week. I see a bunch of 5 by 5s in chat over there. Also, a DOS is good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and it looks like oh, we... DOS is always good. I mean, I try. On occasion, though. I try not to broadcast the parts <laughs> where I'm very much not good. Um, <laughs> anyways, with me today, folks, as you know, on NSF Live, it's usually a group of uh, NSF folks talking about what's going on. And I've got two people with me here to... Day, if I put my thumb too far, that way you can't see it. With me today, uh, starting with Mr. Chris Gebhardt, Assistant Managing Editor for NASA Space Flight. Chris, how are you doing? I am doing absolutely wonderful this fine Sunday. It's a it's a great day to talk about many things throughout the solar system. Ah, uh, yes, it is yeah. indeed. And then also, <laughs> Mr. Hagen, got it. Warren uh, is joining us as yep. well. He's a writer for NASA <laughs> Space Flight, and he's got a huge topic to talk with us about today, right, Hagen? Hagen? How are you doing? Yeah. Yep, yep, awesome. As Chris said, um, a lot of stuff to talk about in terms of the solar system today. So I'm really excited. I love, I love what we're going to be talking about today. All right. And Hagen is on some home internet. You can see that he does his very best Max Headroom impression on occasion. Uh, so bear with us on that today, but we should be good. It just comes and goes very infrequently. Not a lot that we can do about that. Unless somebody wants to super chat and uh, like buy a fiber line out to basically the <laughs> middle of nowhere where you live, right? So uh, we are accepting super chats for fiber to Hagen's house. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> So so let's see this, and uh, I think I think you've cleared up a little bit there, Hagen. Um, we have a lot of stuff to talk about today. We're going to get into that in just a second. As you know, this is our live show, so we try to do them every single week, unless there's like some other launch or something that, that conflicts and makes us a little bit thin on people. Um, but if you have questions for us, tag us in chat, at NASA Space Flight. We try to ask your questions that are relevant to the topic we're talking about. So if we're talking about everyone's favorite orange rocket, some people's favorite orange rocket, and you're asking questions that are completely unrelated. We may not get to those at that time. There, see, look, he's waving. If we're talking about, I don't know, new planets or existing planets that we may be exploring in the solar system, and you ask about stainless steel rings at Starbase, we may not answer that question while we're talking about whatever's behind Chris. Um, so anyways, that's sort of how we do it here. We do try to answer your questions, but if you ask a question that's not really relevant to what we're talking about, it's not that we're ignoring you, it's just that we're trying to keep the topic, the discussion on topic, all right? It's not that we hate you. There are no bad questions, just sometimes questions that YouTube chat asks. Um, so anyways. <laughs> Without, uh, oh, also the Super Chats. If you do a Super Chat or something like that, um, this is one of our normal shows. We don't have a special guest, so we will be thanking people doing Super Chats, taking questions from Super Chats as well. We try to do a good mix of it. We try to do some Super Chat questions, some regular questions, but same rules apply to Super Chat questions. Like, even if you give us 500, well, actually, if you give us $500, we'll probably just do your question like whenever. Um, but if you give it us $20, we'll try, try to save your question until the part that it's relevant to. Um, Anyways, all that being said, I do think that we have actual space flight topics to talk about today. And I believe, as I glance over at the handy dandy links document, we are going to start with the uh, decadal survey that's come up. Are we not? Oh, yeah. I don't know which one of us is more excited to talk about this one. Because, uh, <laughs> yes, the mission I've always advocated yep. for is almost certainly going to happen now. But, Hagen, what was your first impression uh, of it, aside from the length at 780 pages? <laughs> um, very. That was one type of reaction, I will say that. Um, yeah, I, I I didn't really get to the part where, you know, it says, oh, we recommend a Uranus orbiter. 
um, until a little bit after it had been released. And um, when I read it, you know, I jumped around the room in excitement because like Chris said, you know, this is something that I have always, always, always wanted. Uranus is my favorite planet. So, you know, it just adds a whole, you know, other realm of excitement onto it. So, um, yeah. It, it does. And and so so let's sort of back up and talk about why we're so excited about this, right? Because, you know, what, what are we talking about? What is the decadal survey? It's probably, well, as the name implies, it happens once in a decade. And NSF Live didn't happen a decade ago. So let's talk about what the decadal survey is. Uh, basically, this is from the planetary and astronomy groups um, and, and astronomers, planet, uh, you know, planetary scientists from around the world particularly from around the nation who get together and create the survey every 10 years of what are the highest priority exploratory things we should be focused on. Um, and sometimes the decadal survey focuses a lot on what NASA should do. Sometimes it does uh, talk about partnership and encourage those types of missions as well. But it basically sets the science exploratory guide map or, or roadmap. There we go. Roadmap. See, I thought guide and then I thought roadmap. So guide, guide map, map is what that's I ended up doing. It's, it's, it's a thing. And that's what, it, that's what came out. Um, but it's basically the roadmap, right? And what's exciting about it is that the primary objectives, usually the, the, the primary one always gets chosen. And in good funding situations, both the primary and the secondary get chosen. Uh, Cassini, Curiosity, Perseverance are examples of some of the big highest priority science missions with others like Messenger, um, and insight coming in as secondary objectives, but that still happened, right? So it's always a question of, well, it's gonna be the, it's usually always the first one, although that's not always a certainty, but Congress usually really looks at this as the roadmap for how they will fund these missions as well. And the first one, the biggest priority for NASA in the next decade is sending an orbiter and a probe to Uranus. And oh, this is amazing for so many reasons because that background I chose for a reason. That is Uranus. And that is the last photo that Voyager 2 took of it as it retreated away from it on January 24th, 1986. We have never been back. So chose that for a reason, because we are almost certainly going back at this point. Um, uh, and, and yeah, um, exciting in that regard, but we should also talk about the uh, what the secondary one is too very quickly before we sort of deep dive, because Hagen, it is another location in the solar system that, uh, let's just say Cassini showed us some things about it and it very quickly catapulted its way up the life chart in the solar system. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the second highest priority mission that um, the Decadal outlined is an Enceladus Orbilander, Orbilander, which is a combination of an orbiter and a lander in one. And so I know it, it's, I read it and I was like, okay. Um, but anyways, yeah. So the second high, highest priority mission that the Decadal outlined is an Enceladus Orbilander, um, which will essentially go to Enceladus. It will orbit Enceladus and then they'll pick a location to land on Enceladus and it'll land, which is wild to think about that we can do that. Um, and so it's, like Chris said, it's Enceladus has really shot up the ranks of, oh, where could life be in the solar system um, in the past few years because Cassini showed us those amazing jets shooting out of Enceladus' South Pole. And I am highly certain that is going to be one of the primary scientific you know, research areas with the Enceladus Orbilander. But also Enceladus is just a wildly, just it's just such a weird moon. And that's even crazier to think about that it's a moon and not a planet. Um, and there's sort of evidence that there may be an underwater ocean underneath Enceladus's um, icy crust. And so this, there's just a lot of mystery surrounding Enceladus that this Orbilander is hopefully, if it does fly, that it will uncover and just really show us um, and really just, you know, just, 
give us more insight into just how weird of a moon or of a planetary body that Enceladus is. And, and while you're saying that, I just want to point out what this is on screen. These are the geyser jets yeah. streaming away from Enceladus as it orbits within the E-ring of Saturn. Because Enceladus actually orbits intra-ring system, not exterior ring system of, of the planet. So yeah, this these are computer, uh, so B and D are the computer simulations of what it should look like. And then A and C are the actual images of what it looked like captured by Cassini. Nice. Um, but what Hagen sort of, what Hagen sort of referenced there was the fact that, you know, we, we knew Enceladus existed. We knew it had this weird sort of cracked icy crust um, from the Voyager missions, but it wasn't really one of those like, yeah, that, that's where we should go, right? Because Titan's also there and Titan's got a nice thick atmosphere and a water cycle made of methane instead of water. So, you <laughs> know. Hydrocarbon water cycle. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and um, so, so you know, Titan rightfully won out. But then when Cassini actually flew through these geysers and, and these jets coming out of the cracks in Enceladus's southern hemisphere, what shocked everyone was it was salt water. And where there is salt water on Earth, life began. So we know there's heating because we know that this subterranean ocean is in its liquid form because the geysers coming out of the surface. And we also know that because of how it sort of orbits Saturn and how it gets tugged and sort of ex expanded and contracted, which heats the interior of it. So we know this is there. So, so this Orbilander thing, which is just an incredible word to begin with, uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I love it. I mean, um, it is a really cool idea be and, and it's sort of, if you look at the progression of what NASA and what the decadal surveys have recommended as targets and where these missions are, are sort of aim, aim and what these missions are aiming to do, you've got dragon, uh, you've got, um, you've got um, uh, insight on Mars, right? Testing out rotocraft and how, how to fly through planetary atmospheres, which is going to be souped up for Dragonfly, which will go to Enceladus's neighbor Titan to explore that moon uh, around the end of the decade, beginning of next decade. And then you've got Enceladus, right? Which doesn't have an atmosphere. So this is very lunar exploration, like of just going and then hopping from place to place along the surface if you, if you need to. Um, uh, and if your craft survives. So, you know, th this this is a really exciting mission that could really unlock some of the biological questions we have about life and organic compounds throughout the solar system. Uh, because we always talk about Europa, um, which there is a Europa Clipper mission. That was another one of the high priority and secondary uh, decadal surveys from last time um, after Mars 2020, and it got chosen too. So, you know, uh, yeah, so many questions that we have here, but I mean, just together, right, the, these two missions are would really focus in on how the solar system evolved, where life can form, where liquid water can get trapped, and why is it here at Enceladus, but not really at other bodies around, you know, the Saturnian system in this type of quantity? What is it about Enceladus that makes it special? But then that, that orbiter, that land, that, 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 entry probe in you know for for uranus and everything i mean that is one of the key elements to how our solar system formed to begin with of of you know the, the nice model of solar system development which is sort of the best one that kind of explains it right now that says uranus and neptune formed in opposite locations and much closer to the sun and as gravity sort of pushed all the gas giants of jupiter and saturn outward it restricted the development of what became the, the so-called ice giants of Uranus and Neptune. And then they came close to one another, flung each other out to where they are now um, and swapped places. And that mission can really help us answer that question of what they're actually made of, which will tell us where they formed in the solar system, which is mind-blowingly fast. I'm really excited about this. <laughs> this was a good decadal survey. It was a good... Um, I, do you say there's, like, bad decadal... Like, when they, like, I don't know, say that James <laughs> Webb can go or something, you're like, oh, stupid decadal survey. This was a bad decadal <laughs> survey, like... <laughs> uh, no, I don't think I would ever say that. But uh, but this was a real... Th th this was one that, that 
it worked to my heart, so I wore the far shirt because that's nice. where we're going. Go farther, yes. actually, this time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yes. We'll have to make a shirt that says farther. Um, I've got a couple questions here that came from chat over that, if we can hit a couple of these real quick. And uh, some super chats as well. I'll grab the super chats here in a second, too. Um, so one of them talking about, let's see here. Why are these other interplanetary missions important compared to some of the bigger things like Louvoir or Hubble? So were there some other things that we were surprised didn't win in the Decadal in favor of these things going to uh, Enceladus and, uh, and Uranus? Yeah, I just hey, anybody. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, okay. So in terms of mission concepts that were considered but weren't really placed as a priority, um, specifically for the flagship missions, which were which was the Enceladus land, Orbilander and the Uranus Orbiter and Probe are both recommended to be flagship missions. Um, for those that are unaware, a flagship mission is basically Curiosity, um, Mars sample return. These very th these massive, large scale missions that give us a massive amount of information about a planet or something in the universe. Um, it's just a very big mission that NASA develops. Um, costs a lot, but does a lot. So, um, but so anyways, the missions that were considered but weren't selected or placed as priority were a Europa lander, a Mercury lander, um, Neptune Triton Odyssey, and a Venus flagship mission. Um, these are really interesting. Um, I, you know, I read that. I was like, a Mercury lander. A wow. Mercury lander, um, right? <laughs> but one of the first things I want to touch on, though, is Neptune Triton Odyssey, because we saw this um, back with the Discovery Program selection last year. This was a candidate alongside Veritas and Da Vinci um, whenever those were selected. And it's it was cool to see that it was being considered as a flagship, but Actually, the reason it was not selected and the reason a Neptune mission was not selected um, was because of launch vehicle availability, Really, which I thought was very interesting um, to see, um, especially, you know, with SLS and Starship coming online. But basically, it says that in the next 10 years, current with current launch vehicles and upcoming launch vehicles like SLS and Starship, the only way we can get the only planet we can visit in the outer solar system is Uranus um, within the next 10 years. Um, the survey um, says that this Uranus orbiter and lander would launch in a, around 2031 and it would take about 13 years if I'm remembering that correctly to swing all the way out to Uranus um, so arriving in the 2040s and so yeah. I'm looking at my um, calendar to do the math there. It's like arriving in the 2040s. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so that's the problem when you need to stop and can't just fling by it. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, and so for it was just it was cool to see that they included that bit about, you know, we can't we that it says we would love to go to Neptune, essentially, um, but we can't right now. And huh. I mean, hey, orbital mechanics is a very good excuse as to why you can't go to a planet. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and they kind of focused a little bit on the, the vehicles like that weren't Starship. Um, right, right. Like, like, the, like these, mm -hmm. you know, like these, oh, wow, like, well, if it works, great, but lots of work there, still a prototype. And of course, SLS is not going to do any science missions anymore. Um, so they kind of basically said, well, it's Falcon Heavy or Vulcan Centaur as your two options. And they kind of hedged, we're like, well, look at the manifest they've already got. You need to be judicious in how you select your launch vehicles was basically the, the, the claim on that one. And huh. one of the things that makes Uranus very uh, intriguing and uh, as a possible science target now is because of the Jupiter-Uranus alignment that comes up in the early 2030s where you can fling these crafts at Jupiter, use Jupiter for a big gravity assist to get you out to Uranus, but you can design that gravity assist in such a way that you're, you pick up speed, but you don't go so fast that you can't slow down to capture into Uranian orbit when you get there, which is the big thing that these, that this one has to do that the Voyagers, did, well, the one Voyager didn't have to worry about. Did you just say Uranian orbit? 
Is that legit? Yes. Like, is that what you're supposed yes. to say? Uranian? Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's the, oh, God, here comes my English background. That is the adjectival <laughs> form of the word. Yes. Um. <laughs> oh, jeez. Uh, does, does everybody understand what we're talking about there? Like, like there are two big things to talk about. Um, yeah. One is, oh, but what about Starship? Why don't they just use Starship? Um, that's one thing, because Starship hasn't flown yet. Hasn't gone anywhere. Hops don't count. Hasn't taken anything to orbit, right? Neither is SLS. So they have to sort of, if they're doing this planning, work with what they are reasonably sure that it could do. I guess also Falcon Heavy has flown a couple missions, but uh, the other one you said, Chris, Vulcan Centaur hasn't flown yet. Part of it's maybe Correct. flown a little bit, but it's the the actual rocket in that configuration hasn't flown. Um, right. So it will actually need to go through NASA's certification yeah. process for these um, high class, high priority science missions, just like Falcon Heavy had to go through because Falcon Heavy and Falcon 9s did not automatically come out of the gate with them. Vulcan doesn't either. Yep. Um, although you can clearly see NASA wants two. So Vulcan Centaur is going to be the other one. Right. Um, but Falcon Heavy is certified for these major interplanetary flagship missions because later this year on August 1st, it will send Psyche on its way out to the uh solar system asteroids so yes um gotcha uh yeah so that's why we're sort of talking about those two but the decadal survey is not a binding document so just because it mentions the ah. two right so just because it mentions the two that are viable candidates now doesn't mean that when it comes time to select the launch vehicle there might not be a oh wow that one can do it and look at that Delta V performance. My, 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 how quickly we can get there. Yeah, yeah. And, and wish to go with newer options, right? And, and I don't just mean Starship. New Glenn will probably be up and running, dear Lord, we hope so, and certified by that point. I like um, rockets. You know, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, yeah, so um, we'll, we'll have to wait and see. But, but yeah, the Decadal Survey is not a binding document, but like we say, um, it is very rare for the highest priority mission to not get funded and flown. Gotcha. So is, yeah. is it fair to say that it's like the scientific community saying, here's what we think is important for the next mm. X decade, basically decadal survey, decade, yes. right? Um, it's not yes. like Congress or something like that has gone through and said, here is what you're going to work on and here's the money to do it. It's more what the scientists right. think we should work on as opposed to exactly. what's confirmed going to be worked on. Yeah, yeah. and... It, it, yes. it's, 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 it's it's worth noting as well that the decade will not it doesn't just outline the missions that we need to do. It also outlines a lot of scientific objectives that we'd like to focus on and try and cover in the next decade. Um, so it's it, the decade in a way is pretty much a really, really, really long list of recommendations. Um, that we should. <laughs> that we the should questions we should point. answer, right? Yeah. Like, and those yeah. are just the twelve they whittled it down to. I'll <laughs> zoom in a little bit so we can look at this yeah. document. No, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, cool. Um, but 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 that's why you know, like we, we talk about the big flagship missions, but Mars got a lot of mentions in in, mm -hmm. in this as well. You know, completing Mars sample return, which is already underway with Perseverance um, and NASA and ESA working on the Mars sample return and Mars orbiter return vehicles and Earth return craft for that. The Mars Life Explorer program, getting ready for human boots on the ground on the Red Planet, you know, was specifically mentioned as the highest priority in the human sciences um department for extra for extra planetary exploration yeah and things like that so so it, it is it, the survey is is massive right and, and and just to go back to the question about telescopes while space-based telescopes did not get particular mentions aside from yes keep going with nancy grace roman and louvoir and the other big ones that are out there ground telescopes got big mentions this time and we're uh, we're actually the focus huh. of the recommendation for national science foundation supported ground-based telescopic uh, telescopic telescopic observations i know what you meant <laughs> For for and specifically to provide critical data needed to address important planetary science and defense questions. So and, and uh, a telescope that did get a specific mention here is to complete the NEO survey of near Earth objects. Uh, a NEO surveyor, excuse me, NEO surveyor. Um, did get a specific mention in here. So, so telescopes did get mentions, as did Arecibo. Um, Al and Alex. replacing Arecibo. Yes. Uh, what, is, what is Alex saying? National Science Foundation, the other NSF. 
<laughs> yeah, and to be yeah. fair, they only use the acronym, so I really had to make sure I said it right. In- <laughs> Look, <laughs> yes, we're the ones deciding all these things, y'all. NASA Spaceflight NSF. <clears throat> um, if we were, that Neptune mission would be included. Too. There you go. Uh- <laughs> <laughs> the other thing, I, I want to make sure people understand this really quickly, right? Because when we talk about an orbiter versus an orbital lander or something that's trying to oh. actually end up on the surface and it, it has to, it doesn't have maybe an atmosphere to go in or, or whatever, right? To aero break with or aero capture with. Um, this is the thing, and I'm going to do some art real quick. You can get out there faster if you're just flying by. It's like New Horizons going out to Pluto, like way out here you got Pluto, then you got Earth way down here, and there's like orbits involved, and they don't exactly look like this. But if all you're going to do is just take off and go, whew, like right past it, you don't have to, you can get there really quickly, right? You can actually put a lot of uh, velocity in your, and there were other planetary flybys, yada, yada, yada. I'm simplifying this, right? But you can put a lot of velocity in your trajectory if all you're doing is flying by. But if you want to actually stop there and go into orbit or land, you don't want to just be going 18 bazillion miles an hour when you go slingshot and pass the thing, right? You want to be going some speed that's lower so that when you get there and you try to cancel it out, you can actually capture into an orbit around it instead of going slinging by or land on it or whatever. So when we talk about the times to get to these things, you said it was 13 years, right, to get there. If we just wanted to do a flyby, we might be able to get there a lot faster. But if you actually want to go into orbit or you actually want to land someplace, you, you have to sort of balance the speed that you're using and therefore the travel time to get there with the fact that you've got to cancel that out once you arrive so that you can stick around and study the place. Um, <laughs> That gets us in to working with the technology we have and maybe other things will come online. Because if you can put 100 tons in low Earth orbit, you have an awful lot of fuel that you can sling yourself at a planet or moon or whatever and then slow down again. Versus if you've got a much smaller payload in orbit, you have to take a little bit longer to get there. So maybe the technological development while they work on these missions will progress to such a case that it won't be 13 years anymore. Maybe Starship could launch it and they could get there and I'm making these numbers up, right? But they could get there a lot faster in five years and still mm-hmm. in orbit instead of 13. You never know what's right. going to happen. But with the technology that we have at our disposal right now and the fact that they're looking at this in the decadal every 10 years, you got to plan these things out in big time frames. This isn't like, all right, let's launch this thing in six months and be done with it, right? Um, there's so much planning that goes into it and then the travel time that goes into it. It's not just load it up in the rocket and ship it. It's fine. But 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 it, but it's worth noting that um, uh, five years ago, when when committees before the decadal really kicked off yep. uh, two years ago, um, uh, back in 2017, a, another committee had sort of narrowed down the options for the mission, right, and, and what this would look like, and their best estimate based on the rockets that were available at the time to get the orbiter and the atmospheric probe there was 15 years Wow! for a three orbit period. So the fact that the decadal is now talking about 13 year transit times, I know it's not a lot, but that's a lot when you talk about a spacecraft, you know, trekking along through the solar system and all the equipment that you launched has yep. to still be working when you get there. Um, <laughs> you know, that, that's, that's inc- that, that, that just sort of shows you how we've been able to progress it a bit further. And you're exactly right, Doss. I mean, uh, the, the sort of limiting factor right now is the entire thing has to fit in the nose cone of the rocket. But if the rocket is the nose cone and the rocket can be refueled and the probe can just stay in the rocket, and then you've got like, you know, massive amounts of fuel to use to speed up and slow yourself down, Starship could get you there a lot quicker than that because it can afford to take the fuel it needs to slow down. Yeah, the when extra it gets mass. There. You get into the right. sci-fi trope, right? The the interplanetary, yeah. intergalactic sci-fi travel trope of you know the crew using the best technology in the year 2030 <laughs> left for Alpha Centauri, and the crew from 2050 was waiting there for them when they arrived. Like right. <laughs> technology continues to advance, and our ability to get there in some amount of time with the energy we can carry, the efficiency of the engines, whatever you want to say, um, it continues to advance while your probe is on its way. So uh, who knows? Maybe they launch it on something that's not a starship, and then starship yeets something out there that's waiting for it when it arrives. <laughs> Um, you never know. <laughs> Let's grab a couple more questions. We've done a third of the show on, on Decadal so far. Uh, a couple quick ones. Let's see here. 
what gases make up the atmosphere on Enceladus, and would it support human life? Do we know anything? There's not really an atmosphere. It seems like it's trying to create its own atmosphere, right, with these geysers, but it doesn't have an atmosphere like you would talk about Earth or anything, right? No, it does not. It does um, not. Yeah, it orbits within the E-ring of Saturn, which is a very diffuse ring and one that they actually think Enceladus might have created from these geysering events. Ah. Um, yeah, yeah, there's still, still some things to work out there. But uh, but yeah, that, that's the leading theory for why the E-ring exists. Um, but no, Enceladus does not have an atmosphere um, or anything like that. Um, uh, and, and from what we've observed so far, it... it it, it has the traces from what vapors off of it, right. um, but it's not like an atmosphere atmosphere like like that you can use to arrow break or slow down or or no nothing like that. Yeah. Um, so not you know dogs and humans walking around on the surface breathing things, but those geysers are coming from somewhere. Does right. anything live down there where the geysers are coming from in, in a liquid sort of environment or something? Two yeah. totally different That's things. That's the question. Yeah. Oh, Lord, if it could answer that, what a day <laughs> that would be. <laughs> let, me hit a, let me hit a couple more here. Um, okay, here's a good one. Would a Uranus orbiter be the furthest man-made object to orbit another body, or is there something else further out there orbiting something? I... Um... It would be the yeah, okay. Okay. Don't say anything oh, until Chris says something. Yeah, right. <laughs> let's, see, let's see if Chris is right. I'm gonna Google it. Eliminate the sun, and yes, um, well, because a lot of our probes after that are on escape trajectories out of the solar system, but some kind of aren't. So, so orbiting the sun, I see what you're saying. So yeah. orbiting the sun, but I don't think that's the question that's being asked. Um, yes, in terms of distance from the sun, that would be the farthest man, human-made object that would be placed into orbit around another body. Yep. Yes. Yep. All right. Hagen, you agree? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Chris is right. As, as much Chris, as we wanted I'm... to slow down at Pluto, we couldn't. <laughs> like... Yeah. I have a shirt that says that around here. I did it in Kerbal, and uh, I made a shirt. As much, says, wait, that yeah. literally says as much as we wanted to slow down at Pluto, we couldn't. Yes. Because that's scary if you actually, have that exact saying. That's oh actually what I have on a shirt. It's, it's, I'm not even kidding you. Actually, I'll go get it. I'll ask somebody else a question, and I'll go get the shirt. Um, let's see here. Please do, because that wasn't planned. So that was the, the Matrix glitched. <laughs> Okay, is it possible for the Uranus mission if they send a rover to one of the moons? Or, or talk a little bit more about the details on the Uranus, Uranus mission. Hagen, do you oh, have? Yeah. can you handle that for a second? And Chris, jump in, and I'm going to go get my shirt. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, yeah, it, it's worth noting, you know, what the actual mission is. So it is literally called Uranus Orbiter and, and sorry, Uranus Orbiter and Probe. You can't land on Uranus. Um, <laughs> but it consists of an orbiter, um, but it also has an atmospheric probe that they're going to send into the atmosphere, which is going to be awesome. I cannot wait for that. This is like um, Galileo. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so they... It sort of, you know, no, really, that's the extent of it. You have your orbiter and your probe. It's going to, it would be very, very, very difficult um, to design a mission, I guess, at least right now, to send a rover or a lander to, say, Miranda or another one of Uranus's moons, um, because, you know, it's going to cost a lot of money. It's going to take a long time, especially, it's, you have to have a very large spacecraft to do that. So right now, you know, it, it, <laughs> you no, not right now. You know, it, it's not really in the plans to maybe do a rover or a lander at one of Uranus's moons. But we will have a probe attached with the orbiter that is planned to enter into Uranus's atmosphere um, and collect some data, which would be awesome. And I know Dust really wants to show that shirt, but I want to follow. Finish <laughs> no, I'm this not. I'm not. First, I'm waiting until you know? you're done. Yeah. <laughs> I'm very okay. polite um, <laughs> because. Um, what, what what will happen though is is just like Galileo did at Jupiter and just like Cassini did at Saturn, um, it will fly by these moons, right? So we will also get great in situ um, flyby research of Ariel and Umbriel and Miranda and 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 the other moons of of Uranus here, right? The the atmospheric orbiter is very is it's souped up and, and different, but like think it, it's very similar to what they did with the Galileo probe that went to 
um, that went to Jupiter in the 90s where it had a little atmospheric probe that when the orbiter got into orbit, it shot the orbiter, it shot the, the atmospheric probe out and got us a lot of data on what Jupiter's upper atmosphere was like, helped us answer a lot of questions about that. And of course, a big thing with the orbiters too is they're going to be looking at the interior structures of, the, of this planet, right? It's going to be trying to unlock the various levels and what it's seeing and what the wind patterns are telling it. How did Uranus get knocked exactly onto its side? It, it's, it's, it's angled, like its axial tilt is like an insane 89 degrees um, instead of 24 for Earth and 17 for Jupiter or, yep. or five for Jupiter or something like that. Um, you know, like, it, was that when it, you know, got interfered with Neptune and everything, you know, like how did all of that work? How did it capture some of these moons? Uh, are, is really going to be impressive. So we will get all of that, even though there isn't a lander or an or, or a rover component to the moons themselves. Right. Gotcha. Can I show my shirt? I really want to see this shirt now. <laughs> I'm not yeah. even kidding you. I'm not I, even kidding you. All right. This really hang wasn't. on. Hang on. Hang on. Uh, so clearly, this was this is for uh, New Horizons, right? <laughs> and it's clearly a Kerbal riding New Horizons. Of course, the Kerbal is sitting on the RTG um, in a command chair. <laughs> and the the How text the text actually says we can't stop here because we're on an escape trajectory and lack the required delta v to make orbit. <laughs> it is literally what the shirt wow. says. <laughs> I want one. And, uh, I've never seen that before. <laughs> never knew it existed. So, oh. yeah, that was awesome. <laughs> I'm not even kidding you. I have that exact shirt. And I wore that shirt when I talked to Alan Stern at the Intrepid Museum. I had my shirt on. Nice. nice. Well, he <laughs> definitely loved it. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. So um, we've got through quite a bit on the Decadal Survey. Clearly, you yeah. could talk about that forever. They talked about it for like five years or something before they released their results. <laughs> so uh, let me grab a couple Super Chats <laughs> real quick. And uh, let's move on to some of the other topics we have to talk about here. Multispace Industries, 32 minutes ago, says, Shout out to my science bestie, Hagen. Let's get him that fiber, although I hear it goes right to the router. All right. Thanks, Multispace Industries. <laughs> uh, we appreciate you there. Jim Cavett, thank you for the support. Austin Skirvin. Skirvin says, oh, actually, thank you for becoming a, a Capcom member, Austin. We appreciate the support. The membership program is such a cool way to support what we do. We know that we sort of ham it up a little bit on occasion, but uh, if you want access to our Discord, early access to videos, all that sort of things, um, the membership program is really cool. We like post high-resolution photos before we release them to the public and stuff like that for members. Uh, let's see here. JML, <laughs> five curly L's for fiber. There you go. <laughs> see, I didn't even check. I didn't even check, Hagen. Like, uh, fiber is like, what, thirty, thirty-five thousand dollars per mile? And I didn't really ask how far away you were from, like, the local <laughs> fiber, fiber drop. <laughs> Maybe we should set expectations there on how many super chests that would yeah. require. <laughs> um, <laughs> Musical Wolves says, will a sub with rocket engines splash down work to check for underwater life? I don't think that's a part of the mission. Oh, a sub oh, with rocket oh, engines? The Yes, I know, I know what he's talking about. Okay. Um, or I know what they're talking about. Um, they're basically asking, will the Orbalander for Enceladus include some type of, some, some kind of submarine vehicle ah. um, that can go down and explore? Um no, <laughs> but my lord, I wish there could be. Um, no, because yeah. one, one, one of the uh, one, one of the actual issues that we would have with that, that there, there, there are a few of them. Um, but one is how you would actually get down below the ice sheath layer, uh, right? And, and then, you would really yeah. need to make sure that what's underneath the ice is water and not like a layer of, of rock right yeah, you know yeah. at, at, at some point you know at the point where you land and, and try to go down because you really wouldn't tr want to try to uh, access the ocean from the active geyser area because of the instability that creates the damage to the craft mm -hmm. and stuff yeah. like that um but, but I, also, I know exactly what you're thinking there and it's a great question yeah it's also you know it's worth saying you know we don't know how deep we don't know how thick that ice is how thick the crust is you know, how are we going to maintain communications? You know, so 
We've still got yeah. a while until something like that ho- happens. Yeah. But we can hope. We can hope. <laughs> but it's, it's always a progression. It's not like, we're going there and we're going to build a base for a thousand humans tomorrow or whatever. It's right. like, you send this. It's and the we've, start. We've already right. flown by. We got some more information about it. Now we're going to send another mission. We're going to learn some more. Let's go down and try to land on it. Hey, this next one's going to drill into the ice. Like, look at the progression we've done on Mars. Um, mm-hmm. We send something that starts to drill. Then we hit, send something that hits the ground and listens to it. And all these different things, just the more missions we get, it was a seismic joke. Um, the more missions, I loved we, it. Yes, <laughs> the more missions we get, uh, the more we learn about it, and then we're able to use that to inform the design of future missions. We don't just go all in on the first thing. And it's we're going to send a tank crawler that has a drill on the front. Like, okay, not on flight one. Not on flight <laughs> one. Flight two and a half or something. Yeah. Uh, let's see here. Thomas Enfang says, "What are the four?" Kidding. <laughs> If if the Uranus orbiter (laughs) flies on an expendable Falcon Heavy, would it likely require a kickstage and or extended fairings? I don't think they've even gotten that far yet, have they, Hagen? It's it's they do make mention of an extended fairing. Um, Okay. If I have it right here, it says, and I quote from in quotes from the text, it says, "Neptune Odyssey does not have demonstrated viable trajectories for a launch within the decade covered by this survey on currently available launch vehicle configurations, and there is a potential need for modifications to existing fairings." So uh, it does make it does mention that they they factored in you know extended fairings and that of that that capability with launch vehicles when deciding as well. Uh, gotcha. deciding what missions and stuff so okay yeah good deal chris you opened your mouth um You're yeah like- as as yeah well as for kick stages um it would just ultimately depend on what the mass of the orbiter and yep. and um and vehicle ends up being and that's like uh, and then what vehicle is chosen yep yeah uh, and and what the transfer window is are we early in the transfer window at the most optimal mm-hmm. one can we can we nudge it a little bit closer to jupiter you know a little bit further out yep. it's all yeah orbital mechanics is fun um yeah <laughs> yep um let me hit a couple more here real quick and we're going to go on to the next topic uh here's one from stephanie shoot I'm going to go with shoot. Stephanie, I hope I got your last name right. Says, thank you all so much for your hard work. Y'all have fostered my newfound love of all things space. Nothing like listening to a pre-launch show with y'all and then head outside to see it live from Tampa. Keep up the great work. Stephanie, thank you so much for the kind words. We have a lot of fun with this, as you can tell. Like, we're not super straight lay serious news. Like, we try to give you serious facts and stuff, but then they let me on the show, too. Um, and so thank you so much for the kind words. We're, we're so glad that you enjoy it and you're able to experience those things with us. And uh, let's see here. I think we're, we covered in roundabout a lot of the other questions about the Decadalyn stuff. I know that there's a lot of questions here, but I think we've talked about a lot of the topics people have been talking about here. So let's move yeah. on. Yeah. To the next, do we miss anything big hanging? Well, we can always Chris? do so, Decadal Part Two next yeah. week. Yeah, <laughs> Decadal yeah. Part Two. We we can talk about the New Frontiers missions and yeah. um, what they outline for the lunar program and stuff next week. Okay. Good yeah, we, we weren't kidding when we said it's it's comprehensive. Yeah, okay. seven hundred pages. <laughs> yeah. Gotcha. All right, Chris, tell us what's right. going on with the Mega Moon rocket. <laughs> well. Mega Moon Rocket is going to come back to the to it to, to its Mega Moon barn. You should um, say which one. You should say which one. I, I teed it up uh, for you. Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, see, I know which one it was. So I think I added NASA in there. Yes, that's true. There is more than one. Yes. Uh, yay. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah. So yeah. So SLS had an SLS had an interesting but good week. Twitter. I would argue. Um, you wrote a Twitter thread so, about it. I wrote a Twitter thread about it. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, come for the space news, stay for the typos, as I say. I'm sure there are a few in there um, with this one. But um, yeah, so so basically, because of a need to install some enhanced equipment and um, and everything at the supplier of gaseous nitrogen, Air Liquid, um, and I don't actually know if that's how you say the name, but it has become the joke pronunciation that somehow now everyone uses. So... I'm not purposely mispronouncing that, but that's how I think it's actually said. Um, it it's basically, su- I'd call so them and are- ask. I'd just be like, hey, how do you yeah, say your name? But you- it's Sunday. They're probably closed. True. True. 
uh, yeah. Uh, so, so basically, they, they had trouble supplying the sheer amount of gaseous nitrogen that SLS requires for this test. SLS is the vehicle on 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 the range in history that has required the most gaseous nitrogen to keep everything conditioned and purged and ready and and everything. And this was actually the limiting thing a year and a half ago at Stennis, if you remember when they did the green run test firings DOS and they sort of had this cutoff window that wasn't based on the propellant, it was based on literally the amount of gaseous nitrogen they could store on site to support the test. So the offsite supplier is having the same issue supplying this amount, but they know they can fix it. They need time to do this. So in the interim, since they couldn't continue forward with fueling tests, uh, Charlie Blackwell Thompson, the launch director for Artemis, uh, for the Artemis program said, all right, then we're coming back to the BAB to fix the issues so we can actually do the full wet dress rehearsal test. So the first thing they need to fix, and this is going to be the LH2 umbilical photo uh, DOS, is they had a brief... Um, they had a leak, uh, the last fueling attempt they had, and that umbilical, so off to the uh, left-hand side there of the screen, the tombstone-looking thing with an arm that reaches out to the base of SLS. Das will circle it in a moment um, before us. That, yes. <laughs> that is the tail <laughs> service master, TSM, and specifically, it is actually the liquid hydrogen one. Um, and there was a very small leak of liquid hydrogen out of it that they saw during slow fill and when they transitioned to fast fill the leak weight weight rate increased so they knew they had an actual problem in there um some of the troubleshooting that they already did at the pad hasn't found it but they know approximately where it is and what to replace they had the plan to do that at the pad but it's easier to do that coming back to the vehicle assembly building because photo two dos um photo two or re re really photo three but icps <laughs> um because this good old thing had a malfunction too. The interim cryogenic propulsion stage, um, which is the part with the American flag on it um, there, um, uh, had a stuck helium check valve. Uh, helium is used for pressurization of the internal systems and the internal tanks on there and to make sure propellant is flowing the correct direction. And it got stuck open after they swapped out some things on the ground. And they're not really sure why it got stuck open, but they couldn't actually fuel the ICPS with it. So they were going to have to do a modified wet dress. So basically, SLS is coming back to fix those issues. And if those issues are fixed and they still have some extra time because air liquid is not done, um, you know, fixing their GN2 supply issues, they might actually start configuring SLS for launch and take the vehicle as far potentially as connecting the flight termination system batteries to it, but not crossing that line, but maybe crossing that line. Bottom, bottom line, there are a few options for them where they could potentially go back out for wet dress in a much more launch ready configuration, which would theoretically shorten the amount of time that they have to be back in the vehicle assembly building after wet dress. And that is the path that it will follow as it comes back down the crawler way into I, I, the vehicle assembly building. That was such a fantastic <laughs> addition to our latest um, flyover. To our, to our latest flyover. If you yeah. haven't seen our latest flyover, you really should go check it out um, for all the really cool information yeah. that, that's new there. But Jack added that. that and oh, there's Air Liquid. Air Liquid. Um, Air Liquid. Hey, <laughs> however you say it. I don't know. <laughs> Look at the I birds. Really it's like they it. planned that. It is. It really was. Anyways. It was. It was great. But um, uh, but but yes. Um, that that's sort of the update with where we stand for SLS. So no new date for wet dress. Um, and this does basically eliminate the early June window, and all but certainly eliminates the late June, early July window as well, which means the next window would be late July, early August, which is slightly problematic because that is Psyche's interplanetary launch window, and SLS can wait. Psyche can't. Ah, because so it's got a window. Psyche might end up winning if SLS winds up in its late July, early August window. SLS might end up having to wait for Psyche because Psyche's got the miss it and you're done for a year. Yep, yep. Um, whereas SLS can just wait four weeks and yep. try, or we'll wait two weeks and try again. Everything um, with so, the multi-user spaceport works that way. We we had yeah. the SLS <laughs> testing things, but then crew trying to launch, and then what wins that? Right, Axiom went up to the space station. SLS mm -hmm. was out on the pad. It's it's all it's always with the multi-user spaceport sort of deciding which mission is going to go because some have more stringent timelines, some other ones are important. 
Right. But aren't on the same sort of stringent timeline um, because of orbital yeah. dynamics or the fact that people are involved or whatever, right? Oh, indeed. And and the, I think the last photo I'd like to show in this is the SLS one uh -huh. um, in there, DOS, because you mentioned multi-user spaceport. And yeah, we definitely got one good taste of that this week because from our live stream, the, the final one, SLS and Crew 4. <laughs> okay, I was like, which one yeah. do you want me to do? <laughs> yeah, sorry, I, I saw where your cursor was, yeah. Uh, <laughs> because uh, this was our live view of the Starlink 415 or 414 launch this week with SLS and, um, with, yeah, with We'll SLS. center it, it's better if I do it this way. Yeah, well, I was like, where did it go? Um, <laughs> uh, with SLS and Crew 4 on pad A as the Starlink 414 mission launches from, uh, from Slick 40. And what I love about this photo too is in there though, right behind the Falcon 9 on pad A is the, is the Atlas V being stacked for Starliner. And while you can't see it on here, the pad just farthest south of the Starlink one is the Delta IV pad where the next Delta IV Heavy is in its horizontal integration facility getting ready for that flight. So five launch pads and three were occupied and Blue Origin has their launch pad and had the Pathfinder out at it. So you could claim six, but all definitely five of the pads here in Florida all had active vehicles in some stage of preparation on them this week. And that was incredible. Yes, and thank you for noticing, Chad. I have terrible handwriting. I spent way too long as a computer programmer and I forgot how to actually write things. So <laughs> indeed. <laughs> I did. I do like drawing things, Alex. I do like drawing things. Um Okay, so some questions on this. I think we got through that. Let me see if we had any questions come through on these specifically. Uh, somebody asked what the exact psych window is, psyche window is. Do we know that, the exact window? Uh, I can, yes. I know it opens on the first. Uh, hang on one second. Psyche launch window. Ask another question. I'll, I'll yeah. figure it out. That's always, I'm getting another question here. Um, let's see. August 1st through August 26th. Okay. So 25-ish days to get that thing yep. launched in its window. All right. And that's because it's going somewhere else. It's not just going into low Earth orbit or anything like that. It's going It's out. rendezvousing. Yes. It's rendezvousing. Yeah. yeah. So it, yes. it has to be, uh, it has to have a more specific window. Uh, let's see here. I don't see a lot of other questions on SLS. I don't know. A couple people were sort of questioning the whole air liquid thing. Like, it seemed a little bit curious that SLS had a problem, and then all of a sudden the press conference came up, and it was a, oh, a third-party supplier needs to upgrade something, so by the way, we'll just use that time to fix uh, SLS. Uh, that yeah. was interesting so how that came out. <laughs> it was, but to be fair, they had GN2 issues every single wet dress attempt, all three of them. Right. Uh, they had trouble with the air to GN2 transition. They had trouble with um, you know how, how GN2 is used to purge the lines ahead of commodity and commodity meaning either fuel LH2 or oxidizer liquid oxygen you know flow into the vehicle they, they had trouble every single day and the problems were the same and repeating right you know over and over again so it wasn't really a shock when Air Liquid was basically like, well, then let's just stop and let's put the equipment. What was actually more of a shock was when Charlie said that Air Liquid sort of knew this was going to be an issue, but didn't install all of the equipment ahead of time. Uh, so now they are. Um, okay. And th that, was, that was sort of the head scratcher one for me, but um, it sounded like it was something that they sort of knew was coming but maybe didn't fully anticipate for the block one SLS, Okay. but had it all there anyway. Sort of like the liquid hydrogen issue where they knew about it, they saw it coming 
the fix just isn't ready for Artemis one okay. uh, or to be utilized in Artemis one. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's, in, that's important. I think to say, I mean, of course they did yeah. a wet dress rehearsal. It would have been surprising if everything went exactly perfectly the first time, the entire purpose of doing the test is to uncover the issues and resolve them before it's time to launch. So it, it's why they it do actually it. from an, yeah, it actually from an engineering standpoint would have been terrifying yeah. to not find. It's like things. what didn't we um, find? Like if you yes, don't find exactly. any problems, you're sitting there like, "Oh my gosh, we should have found something." Um, because even even SpaceX that had taken the Falcon 9 through multiple static fires, right, which are fueling yep. uh, of it, right? It's everything's a wet dress until you light the engines. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and everything's a static fire until you lift off. Um, yep. <laughs> but um, you know, it, even all that experience they had with the Falcon 9 it took them four tries to get through it with the Falcon Heavy. And one of those was because things got too cold. Ah. So, yeah. <laughs> so, like, yeah, like, it's, it's always a balance with, with these things. And, and finding them has not been surprising. What I will say is good so far, right, is that everything that they have found, even though annoyingly they have to roll back to fix one of them because they didn't build a mobile servicing structure to service this thing when it was out of the pad. Right. Um, that's the reason they have to come back to fix the ICPS. If they had a big mobile service structure, they could wheel up to it like the Apollo era. You could do it at the pad. Right. Um, but, you know, that is a relatively minor thing. And it's the only thing on the rocket that broke. And everything else and the ground stuff has been relatively minor aside from this GN2 issue, which is well on its way to being solved, it sounds. So that's encouraging for like getting back into this and getting through it in the next couple of attempts. Right. You know, potentially. And there weren't any, I mean, they were showstoppers because you're going to clearly fix a hydrogen leak, right? But it was like <laughs> yeah. a check valve yeah. and a hydrogen leak that they identified and are going to mitigate. And, you know, the little things that they identified and said they're going to find. I mean, it's not like they crushed a map massive pipe in the middle of the rocket or anything like that no um and in that regard everything is everything <laughs> has been minor and 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 exactly what you you mean they're showstoppers on the day because you have to stop to fix them right but they're not like oh my god artemis one is doomed and is you know many 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 months delayed no right no. Right. Uh, honestly this is just now going to come down to how long does it take air liquid to put this new equipment in which will drive okay we're going to fix these two issues but how much further to configuring the rocket to launch do we continue because of the extra time we have because until air liquid is done um you know enhancing their equipment yeah it makes no sense to roll back out because right, you can't right. do the test until they redo the equipment they get the stuff done gotcha and hey i want to say this real quick um this tweet right that i was showing yes. earlier then i pulled that image out of this is actually from one of our regular viewers like community members rough riders show so rough riders thank you so much for taking the time to take this screenshot and share it with everybody else on twitter um saying this is so cool to see the space coast filled with rockets launching one after the other um i i didn't notice that. i thought it was like a, a chris b tweet or something and i you know sometimes retweet those and sometimes don't um <laughs> well sh sh shout out to Stephen mar because i thought he had this photograph so ah. i went to find it but but then the photograph didn't have SLS in it. Ah. But then I kept scrolling and found that one. And I was found like, oh, Rough Riders. Well, he's one of our community members, so we can just shout him out on the stream. You know, shout them out on the stream, and yep. it'll be good. I should, I should <laughs> actually, like, maybe I should retweet that. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Hey, here's a link in chat as well. But uh, when, when community members do something like that, when they take a screenshot or something and they share it, it really does mean a lot, especially when you put nice words like that on it, the kind words there. So sorry, boss. <laughs> Chris is yelling at me in channel. By the way, the promises that have been being made in the chat about the number of likes, none of those were passed by the people actually on the show today. So I've seen Chris B over here in chat making all sorts of promises, and he may be writing checks that his hosts aren't going to cash. We'll see. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all might not have seen what he was promising, but I think we need to ship you a razor, Chris. Um, anyways. I'm not shaving. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um. Well, shaving what, I guess, is the question. Um, I'm not shaving my beard. <laughs> so, wait, so so you would shave your head and do, like, your very best British accent? Oh, heck no. Uh, no. <laughs> I don't know how many uh I don't know how many likes this stream has, but I wonder if I can delete likes from YouTube. It doesn't look <laughs> like it. Okay. Anyways, y'all, let's let's get on with some more stuff. Uh, I, we have fun with these shows, y'all. We really do. <laughs>
what what's great is like i i never have like the youtube stream up because i want to concentrate on what the live visual that i'm seeing in front of us is so like and the questions that we're getting asked so yeah i like this yep Let's see here. We've got coming up next uh, sort of a past week recap. Hagen, you want to grab that past week recap here for us? On the spot well, suddenly? No. <laughs> um, I'll let Chris do it, okay. and then I'll add. <laughs> All, right. All right. I have been in school, so gotcha. I've been with everything. Okay, good deal. <laughs> No, that that definitely works. Uh, yeah, this past week uh, there there was definitely some highlights um, from the past week, starting with the return of the Shenzhou thirteen mission from China. This was their six month mission to the Tiangong space station, their new modular space station. Um, this is one of the crew members uh, being extracted from the capsule after a successful landing out in the desert there in China. Um, uh, this mission launched back in October. I think coincidentally, it was exactly six months, like the liftoff day and landing was October 16th and I I April 16th for this particular mission. Um, so a really good long duration stay outfitting the first module and performing new science and, and everything up there on China's space station. And um, yeah, that mission came back and uh, they don't do direct handovers of the Chinese crews, at least right now, because of the docking port situation that they've got up there. Right. Um, and the Tianzhou 3 cargo resupply vehicle was already there. Um, and this crew needs to come home and the next cargo resupply, Tianzhou 4, will be launching in... Um, uh, no earlier than May 10th, and then the crew and the next crew will follow shortly thereafter. This is a great photo because after six months, right, some astronauts are, you know, even though they exercise, are, are not are not capable of walking. You see this on a lot of the Soyuz missions when they come back um, of, uh, you know, the medical care that they undergo. So this was another one of the crew members after he got out of the capsule um, there as well being taken for some initial medical checks. But um, yeah, it's this next phase of, of time on the station is going to represent a really big expansion uh, for the orbital lab because um, after, so, so Tianzhou, Three is up there now. Four will launch in May and will also be there when Tianzhou 14 arrives with its crew. Uh, now, Matt Crawford actually has a render of what this will look like in the station's soon to be current config once Tianzhou 4 and Shenzhou 14 arrive. Um, and you can see the two Tianzhou cargo craft are on either end of the module there, and Shenzhou 14 with the crew is approaching from underneath uh, for that docking to the module um but what's really fun right now is yes so uh, yes so the one uh, docking yes <laughs> so the module that is on the the part that's closest to where shenzhou will dock as well so that is the um so so basically that's the tianzhou module that yes that's tianzhou three uh, the one that was launched a while ago, it will be the next to deorbit in June. And that will actually clear the way for the Wentian module, which is their next science module. And Wentian will actually come up and dock to that same port that the Tianzhou is at right now, because that is the one that has the active docking apparatus to it. So the new science module will come up, dock there, and then this little crane arm will reach out grab it after it docks and just move it 90 degrees over and stick it onto the side. Um, and we can sort of see the construction video um, yeah. <laughs> coming up here too. Um, because then later in the year, the final module, uh, Megatian, will be launched in October. Um, so you can see, um, it, it skips ahead. Hang on. Okay. It skips ahead. I was like, all right, cool. Guy showing off it his model ahead. rockets. Hang on. It's, it's, part of, it's part of a larger video. I guess the timestamp wasn't exact, exact on yeah. that one, uh, <laughs> as, I, as I was hoping it was. Here it is. Um, yes, but yes, here it is. Here it is. So you can sort of see the current iteration of it. Um, and then the final version of this. So this was... I, that timestamp didn't work. My apologies oh, for okay. where I sent that video. Uh, but basically, their new modules um, will be up by the end of the year. Um, and that will complete the overall uh, construction of their space station, which is about a fifth the size of the ISS. So very, very busy period coming up for the Chinese station. 
why, uh, with that landing. Why is the inside of it so clean? Is it just that it hasn't been up there since like the 90s? It looks very organized. And you look at the ISS and there's yes. like a laptop strapped to the wall. <laughs> yes. So they do have some of that here, but this is taking an, a, advantage of the massive advancements in technology since ah. the ISS modules were designed in the late 80s. No vacuum tubes up there. I'm kidding. I don't think there's yeah. any vacuum yeah. tubes on the yeah. station. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's the comparison point to it, basically. Um, yeah, it, it just, it's just—it's—it's a lot. This is, to be fair, a lot what, like what the Axiom, the interior of the new Axiom modules are going to look like. Very ah. clean and everything like that. No, this is just what new space stations are going to look like um, because ISS was very plug and play uh, <laughs> when we were figuring it out and we learned those lessons. All right. It's almost got like some undergrowth in the ISS because it's just been built up over time, I guess, right? It kind it kind of is. And, and, you know, like the ISS modules have a lot of pipes and ducting going everywhere because we didn't really understand how air would flow between the modules and evacuating carbon dioxide and exchanging for oxygen and keeping all of that going. Whereas now, now we've learned all those lessons so we can incorporate them just de facto into the new modules just like China does here. Okay. Let's see here. I think that covers what's going on with China. What else is go or what else has been going on uh, the last week here? Yeah, let's go to Axiom here, Das, if, okay. you, if you don't mind, Axiom. because I think that's the other big one. Uh, the, the other big thing that we've all that, that, that didn't happen, but that has a major effect on what comes next uh, uh, here. And basically, Axiom's return has been slipping. Uh, this turned in. This turned from a ten-day mission to an eleven, to a fourteen, to a sixteen, to a you know, <laughs> day mission. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Here, because basically our late. I'm gonna <laughs> late spring in Florida. I'm using air quotes for late spring there. Don't laugh at me, rest of world. Um, you're lucky we have spring at all in Florida. Um, <laughs> But um, basically the late spring weather and specifically the cold fronts that descend down across the US and then come through Florida and wreak havoc ocean wise with the Gulf and Atlantic sides has not been behaving in terms of being able to get the Axiom mission down. <coughs> Sorry, and Axiom needs to leave before Crew-4 can launch because it is at Crew-4's docking port. So it's kind of important for this to come home before Crew-4 lands. And then you sort of have the added complication of you need the uh, Axiom Dragon to have enough time for data review after its, after its flight before they clear the Crew Dragon for Crew-4 to lift off. Um, and, and anyway, this is currently where it's sitting right now. Uh, Axiom should be undocking later tonight and coming back home uh, on Monday. And then that should clear the way for Crew 4 to lift off on Wednesday morning at um, 3.52, something like that um, in the morning. Early, um, early <laughs> is basically the answer to that. Um, uh, and, and then hopefully that, that'll that clear things up and allow Crew 4 to get on their way and then allow Crew 3 to come home uh, later in the week. But also very important too um, was the uh, follow-up question from Irene there on that screenshot that Kathy answered, which was the timing and the spacing between the two missions, which was confirmed finally at two um, because we'd heard four and two and different things here and Kathy uh, sort of finally confirming that it is in fact two like that, uh, right? Days that they want. Yes, indeed. 48 hours, and this is 39 hours with the schedule they're doing, so they're sort of splitting a little close, close enough. Yeah. Yeah, but but like basically she's saying like they think they've got enough time, but two days is the rough tally there. Gotcha. All Which, right. to be fair, kind of matches what Bill Gerstenmeier, um, SpaceX's new like head of like, if he says it's fine, in Gerst we trust, because um, he came from NASA with, you know, running NASA's human space program for for decades. So, and he's now with SpaceX, and that was sort of the timing that he had said between crew missions that he was comfortable with was about two days. So, we see that matching on NASA's side now too. All right, uh, what else should we just speed run the other things in the news this week? Yeah, okay. Um, I know we're well, running out of yeah, time. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, SpaceX successfully launched a classified NROL uh, mission for the National Reconnaissance Office to a week ago, which is why NSF Live didn't happen because we were all covering that one. Um, that so that so that mission um, lifted off in pseudo Vandy fog, um, and that was the view from the press site from the NSF camera. It looks and, like and it exploded. Like, 
Yeah, I and mean, then it was just barely fog. see it and yeah. into the yeah. clouds it goes. So, <laughs> welcome to Vandenberg, people. Um, that's what it looks like sometimes. It is. I think like right there, you can see the exhaust <laughs> yeah. like going into yeah. the cloud. That is what a launch from yeah. Vandenberg looks like sometimes. So, you know, the NRO, you know, wanted some more secrecy super to their secret mission. mission. I mean, it, yeah. it, it is a classified uh, mission. So. Yeah, so, they activated the, the NRO fog machine. Got the activated. NRO fog machine. Uh, nice. Uh, but anyway, uh, uh, it was a classified mission, but it did get to orbit successfully. Um, and the booster did return to land um, right there. So, um, all was well with that mission. And then the other thing that we did have this week, Das, was uh, a Russian EVA or oh. spacewalk from outside. Oh, it's not a sorry, Russian sorry, EVA. No, sorry. 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 No, you went in the correct order. I, I went in order. Um, you went in order. Sorry. I skipped and, and totally forgot. Um, this was the Starlink uh, 414 liftoff of uh, 53 new Starlink satellites uh, on Thursday from uh, Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Uh, the second time a Falcon 9 booster flew for the 12th time and there was the epic shot of uh, SLS and Falcon 9 cheering the other Falcon 9 on uh, and watching what they too one day will do. Um, so, uh, uh, and, and another mission that went uh, very well for SpaceX, uh, getting those satellites into orbit. And it was also cloudy in Florida as well, uh, as you could see there. Uh, <laughs> nice from the from, port from though, the, at least. From the view from the port. Nice nice little view there as, uh, as she broke through the cloud deck there. Um, okay. Yes, and, then... and now I think we're actually ready um, for the penultimate update from this week, which was we had a Russian EVA um, um, out of the Russian side of the International Space Station. Uh, and this was to primarily do work on the Russian, ro uh, sorry, the European robotic arm, which was delivered with the Naoka module in uh, July and August of last year. Um, so they went out to do the first of those EVAs to get the robotic arm from Europe up and running, which primarily consisted of mounting the control um, station to the outside so that they can use this for uh, for future scientific endeavors and placement of, of experiments on the outside of Nauka without an astronaut or cosmonaut having to go out and do that. And that EVA went very well indeed. In fact, it was six hours and 30 minutes planned and they were out for six hours and 37 minutes. So there we'll call go. that right on the timeline. Um, and, and that was about it um, for this past week, except for one what? final update that DOS has, I think, right? Um, you have to do the update, Chris. I put it in the links document. It's aerospace news. Yeah, be, well, because we had another flight-related update that happened this week as well, <laughs> correct? We did. We did. Um, on my back deck, four baby eastern bluebirds were hatched. And uh, yes. I have my live cameras of the bluebirds in the bluebird nest. Um, the the, the tie-in here is a lot of our technology that we use in Starbase Live and stuff like that starts on my back deck in the backyard. And uh, some of the things that we do at Starbase literally were pointed at the baby bluebirds years ago. And I always run this stream every year. It's it's like a like a family sort of project that goes on. little <laughs> bright sun coming in the door there right now. But this is live feeds from my back deck. Robotic cameras, the whole, the whole shooting match. But uh, four 14, 16 days, they should be fledging and flying out, and I keep this up 24-7 the entire time the babies are in the nest. So anyways, that's important aerospace news. Thank you, Chris. And now from small bird to gigantic bird, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. Okay, um, yeah. gigantic bird. Next yes. up, tell us about what's going on with everybody's favorite milkshake rocket, Starship. Oh boy. Um yes. <laughs> uh well, a lot happened. Uh some 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 things happened this week at Starbase, you might say. Um <laughs> Uh, I mean, we we had a, we had a, the normal stacking operations that 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 went on with booster eight still undergoing um, its overall stacking operations, uh, but uh, you know I think some of the interesting things were this week where we definitely saw. 42 Raptor V2 engines delivered this week. You know, 42 is a nice number there, um, Wait. especially for for geek fandom. I think oh, it was sorry, engine just... 42. <laughs> Sorry, it was, it yes. was Raptor, Raptor number 42. 42. <laughs> yeah. There we go. Which was sorry, misspoke there. Raptor okay. 42 was delivered, uh, which is a nice number uh, for an engine for those of us who are science fiction fans. Yes, uh, and and stuff like that. Um, uh, but but we also saw uh, you know 
a, a bunch of Raptors and specifically Raptor 2s being delivered this week. And we know that that was one of those items as we're sort of inching toward the next round of testing. We need to see um, Raptor 2 engines being installed onto these vehicles for their various tests. Um, and you can definitely tell that's a Raptor 2 from how clean it looks. Yeah, there's nothing uh, on it. Yeah, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's, it's a simplified engine, that's for sure. Um, but uh, but yeah, that, that's definitely going to be one of the next elements of the test campaign, right, in terms of the, the, the additional fueling tests that we know are on tap for these boosters um, and the continued construction. Um, I, I think the thing that I would really like to focus on first, Doss, is yeah. the environmental review. If we okay. could pull that tweet. Um, the uh, likely to be delayed again? Is that the one really you want? Really quick. Yeah, exactly. Right. Um yeah, talk. because because this was the big thing uh, I, I think that everyone was sort of looking for. And well, we missed some deadlines again this week. Um, specifically, the Section 106 review got pushed from the end of the month. It had been um, scheduled for completion on the 21st on, on, on Earth Day. Um, and uh, curiously enough, the Endangered Species Act is still showing as, um, as, as, as you know, 421, but that, that, that is probably pushing as well um uh and everything so you know when is the exact environmental assessment review going to be done not this month uh we can almost certainly uh say that at this point um i guess there is the possibility that if you can get endangered species and section 106 if those are actually like done they just haven't dotted the i's and crossed the t and they don't have the formal one to copy and paste into the report that right. maybe that's why it only shifted a couple days and there's still a chance this is done by the 30th of may by the 30th of april but like uh we're we might be into may at, at this point um for when that is going to to happen and i know that's a, a question that comes up a lot so i definitely wanted to hit that up front um before we talk about the other complicating factor which is basically what happened to booster four because das higgin I, I i hear something happened to it <laughs> Seven, I think there was some uh, yeah. booster seven. Oh, I said four. Yeah, yeah, you said seven. four. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Seven. I swear, it's all I was good. looking at seven. I'm sorry. It's... I'm sorry. I'm I'm not meaning to mess up this this much here. I meant seven. I was looking at seven. Um, no, it's it's all but, good. Let's see but here. But basically, yeah, there was a. Uh, Yes, yeah, seven is quite a number for SpaceX right now because we definitely saw it roll back right from the from the launch site, which was not in itself a surprise. We expected that, you know, going back to get its 33 Raptor engines and everything installed, except, oh boy, we've all seen that photograph, right? <laughs> we have. Yeah. I, I think what yeah. we've got, hang on a second. This is a yeah, good let's... way to illustrate it, right? Yeah. If yeah. We go because over we here... need to talk about what happened inside of Booster 7. Look, let me, let me grab this real quick because we've yeah. got, let's see if I can find it in the video somewhere in the video. Where are they? Aha. All right. So gaze yeah. upon this transfer tube. Right. This is actually yes. I'm pretty sure this is two parts of that form one tube. Right. Um, these are delivered at Starbase. What is that? Yesterday. <laughs> yeah. Yesterday. Yeah. Um, where we got photos of them yesterday. And so this is what a transfer tube is supposed to look like. Right. The round. Yes. You transfer things through the middle of them. Right. Um, <sighs> we've seen. Well, if you've been around Reddit and places like that, you may have seen the photo that was apparently leaked from SpaceX showing a transfer tube allegedly inside Booster 7 that doesn't look like this at all. It looks like a milkshake straw that you tried to drink when the milkshake was still too cold and solidified, and the straw just crumples on itself instead of actually flowing milkshake through it, right? Mm -hmm. um, you've probably seen that photo, right? Um, that is, again, allegedly the inside of Booster 7, not something that SpaceX yeah. has officially said. I personally haven't seen anything from Elon confirming that or anything like that yet, but it's all over the Twitter sphere, Reddit sphere, whatever you want to call it, uh, in the last day or so, and it is not this photo. This is the photo of no. properly formed transfer tubes. So if the is, it, it is a good, it's a good analogy. Who here hasn't drank, like tried to drink a milkshake and it's too cold and the straw just like crumples? That's what the yep. transfer tube inside Booster Seven allegedly looks like right now. Um, 
So I think we did make the decision since it was not an officially released photo or a photo we took. It, it was a leaked photo that maybe shouldn't have been leaked. We're not going to show it here on the show out of respect to SpaceX. It's all over the Internet if that's something that you want to go look up. Um, but it may signify serious and potentially irreparable damage to Booster 7. A significant delay to Booster 7. I don't know. And Again, not official, right? Right. And and, and then the, the, the other side of that, right, if, if that photo is real and that, that is what the inside of Booster 7 does look like after this test, how did that happen is, the, is now the biggest question um, that I think would be on SpaceX's mind. Right. Um, and, and because it's not just as simple as potentially, oh, and here are new transfer tubes, let's swap them out. Because unless you really understand what happened, and, 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 and let me sort of place this into like a couple of quick categories, right? Of like, oh, something that's really understood. Like that time they accidentally depressurized the, uh, the methane tank. Right. So on the bottom, and they hadn't depressurized the methane tank up top, so the top became too heavy to be supported by the bottom, and the booster just crumbled. That's a known issue. They shouldn't have done it that way. They always, you should always depressurize the top tank before the bottom tank. That was just a procedural error that will never happen again because I guarantee you there are software inhibits. Right. You know, it's, it's like a make sure process it problem. Again. It was a process problem. Right. And can you lock it out? Can you mitigate it with software or controls right. or whatever? Is it a checklist somebody needs to have? Um, potentially that, the same sort of thing happening again. Again, we're saying allegedly, right. like, like clearly right. until SpaceX comes out and says something or they cut Booster 7 in half and you see a crumpled tube in the middle of it. Um, right. It's not 100% accurate information, so a little bit of speculation on that. But clearly something we have to talk about because it was all right. over the place yesterday. But but if this is a potential significant design issue with the vehicle, now we're in a very different realm from, oh, a procedural error. But, but that's what makes this so hard. And I know it's questions that people have, but it's really what makes this so hard is until we know which which option that is arcing toward, you don't have a good sense for what this means longer term yeah um yeah so like does does um, booster eight have the same problem is there anything they can do with booster eight to mitigate the problem was it just a, a process thing and you don't need any physical right. changes to booster eight and literally the software just triggered this valve to open before this valve opened or whatever um I, I, we don't know again no official well, word from I, spacex I, and and we always have to remember spacex tests in weird ways so i don't want to jump to this conclusion and i don't want people to think that i am suggesting that this is what they were aiming for but we don't know exactly what they were testing this could be an issue they could have also been trying to test something to failure and that's how it failed and now they've got that piece of information we don't know right spacex isn't saying out there standing out there with a megaphone the next day going and the test we did yesterday was you know so uh, it, it, there's sort of this interesting dynamic going on here of leaked photo is that actually from the inside of booster 7 if it is what were they actually testing when it did that was it a potential thing they were trying to test a failure or was this a oh boy we didn't expect that what happened it, I mean, that's sort of your your range of options, you know, without knowing much more. Yeah, exactly. So it's something we're going to, of course, keep our eyes open at Starbase. We have cameras. Mary and Nick are out there paying attention to what's going on. Um, of course, everybody's following Elon on Twitter, and he may say something about it if Tim asks him. I don't know. Um, but uh, we're trying to we're, we're trying to see if we can get more information on it. Not anything SpaceX has said officially. I want to stress that. Um, but of course acknowledging the presence of the photo and what people think that it is, how is that going to affect everything else is a really great question. But Booster 7 did come all the way back. It's potentially something that may be really hard to fix. Are they going to try to fix it and continue testing? Or are they going to try to fix it and fly it? Are we going to see them cut Booster 7 in half and open it up and then put a new tube in? It's not like a little tube, right? It's a massive tube inside the middle of the rocket. I think our design changes video actually has an illustration of it. Let me see if I can bring it up real quick to uh, explain what's going on there. It, 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 it's, it's what brings the... It's what brings the oxygen down from the top tank to the engines at the bottom. And, and it's what allows all of that liquid oxygen to be pumped, densified oxygen to be pumped up yeah. into the tank to begin with. But then it also is the fuel line, right? On SLS, that big thing is on the outside of the vehicle. On Starship, it's on the inside. Um, 
uh, that that's sort of the purpose of the of the downcomer yeah the, the, the tube and everything i'm sorry I, I may have not gotten the right uh part of the video here that sort of illustrates that part let me see if i can scroll around a little bit i didn't we didn't have this video ready to go in advance so i'm trying to see if i can find it by scrolling around but we're going to continue keeping that our eyes right open that, that actually was the right part that they were saying to show ah okay there. All yes. right, so it doesn't uh, actually show that too, but that's the area right, but where, that's where it, it would connects be. to. Right. Okay, all right, right. gotcha. Right. Okay. Oh, and, oh, and more after twos. Yeah. <laughs> yes. More after twos. Oh no, what are we gonna do? Uh, this video is actually narrated, and I couldn't listen to the narration, which is why I turned on the closed captions and right. I was trying to read what it was saying while I showed it. But uh, if you want to watch the entire video yourself, let me put a link to this video in chat. Here we go. I'm just going to link to that right there and then go back to the timestamp here like this. But if you want to listen to the narration, it's all about design changes in Starlink, in Starlink, in Starship. Um, we have an entire narrated explanation and graphics and video and all this sort of stuff. It's one of the actually one of the cooler videos we've done because of yeah. all the explanation and the animations and stuff that everybody holds. But here's this is the area where the photo was taken from, even though it doesn't show the big tube that we think is crumbled there. That's sort of what this is illustrating. So, anyways, have a look at that video if you want to understand more about the insides of a uh, starship. I think, right? Let's see here. What do we need to cover anything else with Starship? I know we sort of got a little off the rails there. Uh, yeah, I think the only other thing we'd really want to cover is the uh, Florida Starship progress that we have oh, seen. Yes. Because if you have not seen our latest flyover video, we've got another um, flyover video. <laughs> you've, you've, you, you should because it is really interesting how much things change in like even a week. Um, uh, there, but yeah. Um, uh, uh, so, some more progress being made. You can definitely see um, a lot of the tower bases coming together um, over there, as as well as a lot of progress over at Blue Origins facilities and what was out at their launch pads um, as well, and, and the new areas that they are uh, that, that they're building, and, and a lot more land clearing going on at this uh, the sh former shuttle landing facility. Yep, um, there as well, and good old Hangar X. Good old uh, Hangar X. <laughs> <laughs> Good old Hangar X, which is which is really neat, and and you can sort of see how that how that is helping them with their booster cadence and everything, um, with uh with with the booster that is planned for the next Starlink mission. Um, oh and, yeah, and what was the deal with that actually? Yeah, yeah. Um, one of the things that Alex was um, was talking about is um, it was the same one that launched Axiom One earlier this month. Is ah. the planned booster for the Starlink flight coming up this month? Um, and yeah, that that would uh, that would set that would break Falcon's record by about a week if they can do it. Um, uh -huh. uh, Falcon already holds the record at twenty seven days flight to flight for the same for the same vehicle, um, and it would come in at about twenty ish. Days, okay. If they if they get off the ground uh, at the end of the week, so that could be really cool. Yeah. Um, an, another yeah, statistic yeah. that people are interested in, like how rapidly can they and have they actually turned around a booster? Like Chris said, it's 27 days right now. Could they do it faster? Is, there are lots of things that go into exactly that, but I don't personally think that SpaceX has really pushed the boundaries yet. Um, and I think and they're going to. Here we might see them coming. To yeah, do maybe that. start pushing exactly. it a little bit. You know. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Because you know, we we saw um, yeah. because what we we saw earlier, right? Like they they did that twenty seven day turnaround, and it's been a while since they have achieved that again. Um, yep. But we know that the goal is to use those Falcon nines as quickly as possible, and this sort of record twenty day turnaround um, that that we're that we're seeing between Axiom One and Starlink Group Four Sixteen. I mean, if if they can start replicating that that process, even if they just do it on Starlink missions, yep. right? Um, I, well, now suddenly I can understand how they're getting to 60 this month, this year, while adding more flights like OneWebs you right. know, to their, to their, um, uh, to their manifest overall. And there's so, a tweet um, from Alex right there. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're quote tweeting something from Elon about the Falcons, the Falcon 9 team doing such a great job. And uh, this is where Alex was saying Booster 1060, trying for a record 20 day turnaround from launching Axiom 1 which hasn't even come down from the space station yet, right? Uh, to launching Starloop Group, group 416. So uh, that's what we were talking about when we were referencing that. Let's see here. Oh, and the new booster is going up on a Starlink mission next month. Thanks, Alex. 
<laughs> you know that Alex is over here yeah, like feeding us stuff in the we, background. I'm like, what? What else do you well, want which, us to which, say? Which is also kind of interesting. It's, it's Booster 1073. B 1073 is new, and it will debut on a Starlink flight. And it has been a long time since a booster debuted on a Starlink flight. Yeah. Um, let's let's just make that very clear. So we're also hearing, um, you know, so we're also seeing that if SpaceX needs to add to just, you know, continue the manifest and continuing that replenishment and managing the booster inventory that they have, they'll, they'll launch one for the first time on, a, on an in-house Starship one, um, which, and it might be that a booster has never debuted on a Starlink one. I need to go back and, and actually look at that. It's either been a really long time since that's happened or it's never happened before. So yeah, um, yeah. Need, need to go back and, and, and check exactly which one it is, but Gotcha. Yeah, here we go. All <laughs> right. Well, this this is like a specific situation that I I think was sort of architected by Elon, because SpaceX has Falcon Nine, right? And they use Falcon Nine to launch customer payloads for people that aren't SpaceX, and then they use Falcon Nine to launch customer payloads that are SpaceX with the Starlink missions. And when SpaceX launches a Starlink mission, surely it's critical. The the internet or the internet satellites, they do cost money. They want to get the constellation built out. But it is a constellation launch. It's not like they're launching one spacecraft to Mars and if something goes wrong, that's a huge problem with the Starlink mission. Like it would be a little bit of a setback, but because it's a constellation that's supposed to have thousands of satellites in it, if they were pushing the limits with a booster, on a Starlink mission and something went wrong, it's not like the probe doesn't make it to Mars or the entire program has failed or anything like that. So SpaceX is in this really unique opportunity where they can test out things on a mission. They can push the limits. They can try things, the turnaround times, improving things, whatever. But they're not risking a huge amount because it's a Constellation mission. But they're also not just yeeting concrete into orbit, right? They're not throwing them, like doing no mission. It's still a commercial mission that they get paid for because of Starlink. They're launching something that's useful, but it's not a huge risk if that if something happens to go wrong with that mission because Starlink is a Constellation. And I think a lot of people don't really think about that. Like that's why SpaceX has the capability to push the limits and test these boosters in ways that other companies may be a little risk averse to, but they still get paid to do it because they're launching something that's useful for Starlink, right? Yeah, and and uh, like to sort of like sort of marry that together with with the overall thought process behind Starlink and why these are the missions that these are are, are tested on and where the fleet leading flights always happen, right? Of twelve and thirteen, and and gosh, we'll probably get to twenty before the year is out, right? Um, you know, on at least one booster, but um, th they have even lifted off with m malfunctioned dead Starlink satellites in that payload fairing because it is not worth it to them from a time and cost perspective to stop, bring the rocket down, de-stack the, well, we have to take 18 off because it's 19 oh. down in the stack to, <laughs> you know, to take it off. They just go like, no, just, just launch Ship two, it. three, four of them dead and just never raise their orbits and deorbit them. Yep. It, it's, it's cheaper to do that, you know? Hmm. So, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I'm going to see if we had any specific questions here. There's some super chats as well. We're a couple minutes over, um, I know, but it's because this is like a talk show. Like we literally just talk and we don't have a script. It's not an eight minute video that tells you about the Starship design changes or what's happened at the Cape or anything. If you want those videos, you can click on those too. We have those. Can you imagine us trying to do one of those narrated videos without a script? Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'll do it. Hey, sign me up. Give me some bullet right. points and I'll just, I'll just like throw out the narration for a video like... One take, no corrections. Let me know what I need to talk about. Some of it will be correct. That'd be fun. That'd be fun to try once. Maybe yeah. <laughs> the DOS one shot or, or, narration, or, or, or just like two of us sitting there going like, I don't know what that is. Well, maybe oh, it's our attention <laughs> pod. Moving on. Uh. I'm, I'm, yeah. Me and Jack, me and Jack should just turn on live audio, like play the edited video, and then just do the VO for it. Just hot. I, this actually is not the, a bad idea, but. <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, I'm going to grab a couple more things here. Super Chats real quick. Thank you so much for the support. Brandon Land, appreciate you. A couple Super Chats there. Andrew Berg. Um, <laughs> SLS is fine, but NASA style is Jupiter 4. Nice. Uh, Pa Angel says, with the cadence Elon wants, won't the cape be a huge bottleneck? Ah, will the cape be a ah. huge bottleneck? That's a good question. That is a good question. The Cape has been making continual improvements um, since the last time they formally updated everyone on what the sort of minimum they can support between missions, which, you know, like 
they said 16 and then it was nine. So obviously they've done more improvements and, and they've hired yep. more people so they can swap out teams. The, they want to get to a more airport airline model where they are able to support more than one a day. And this is historically possible because the Cape used to launch within 90 minutes of each other. Right. Um, the, in the Gemini program, the human Gemini program, the Agena target vehicles were launched into orbit and 90 minutes later, the Titan rocket would lift off from the neighboring pad with the crew to go chase it down um, for the flights. So th they lost that capability and they're trying to get back to that capability again. So the bottleneck is honestly, I think, more going to come not from a how can the range support X number of flights a day, but, you know, if you have one little holdout that goes, well, I don't want to use that system. Well, I don't want to use an uh, automated flight termination. Like, at what point does the range just go, well, you have to. Well, all right. If you launch at this range, you have to have this or whatever, right? Right. Exactly. There's a lot exactly. that goes into that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I've, again, I'm trying to speed run some stuff here because I know we're already over. Um, <laughs> hey, can you have to go anywhere? <laughs> Nope. <laughs> <laughs> just like stand up and walk off. Like if you're like, all right, well, I got to go guys. And Chris and I'll keep talking. Um, let's see here. Oh, this is another good one. Like really quickly. Musical Wolves. Could Axiom splash down on the West Coast and use the Dragon for future space tourism missions? I saw some tweets earlier today that it looks like multiple ships have been deployed to both sides of Florida, giving them more options for recovery. Is that true or false? I think it's true. I wouldn't have said it if I was pretty um, sure it was true. And, and, and yeah, so the, the well, there are. Sure. <laughs> yeah, you've got um, you've got a couple. You got a, four areas out in the Gulf. You've got Tampa, uh, the, uh, the, the 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 Panhandle. You've got Pensacola, um, and, and stuff like that. So I mean, more. Yeah, you've got so you've got those four and those. Um, we always deploy to the West Coast just in case, and we always deploy to the East Coast as well. Um, we normally station in Tampa to begin with, and right. then if the if it's looking like it's going to be the Pensacola, you know, farthest West Mobile areas um, of of um, yeah, if it looks like it's going to be Panama City or Pensacola, we'll then reposition um, for for there. But that's where we sort of go with. Um, it honestly just comes down to where it looks like it's going to be best. Right, and, and right. They, they have a better idea of that um, because you have to phase Dragon after she leaves the ISS to align with Pensacola, Panama, or Tallahassee, Tampa. Right. Because um, this, the capsule does not have the woohoo, here we go, cross range it <laughs> like the shuttle did. Um, so they actually have to physically move the ground track of the orbit to align with one of these um, right, right. when they make the final decision. Right. So so what I was what I had seen earlier today was yeah. a tweet from a space offshore Gav who was talking about the two recovery ships going off. Megan uh, was on the Daytona yes. site, but steaming towards the primary Jacksonville site. Shannon's loitering between Pal Panama City and Tallahassee locations. Oh, that's what I was talking about. Oh, I'm sorry. That's for every crew landing. Gotcha. Um, so yes, they have so options. Yes, the names of the ships have just changed, but yes, in general, right. like Megan will always be on the East Coast and Shannon will always be deployed uh, to the West Coast. And Shannon's actually been there since they lifted off because if they have to come back very quickly and they can't dock, they need a recovery ship in the Gulf just right. in case. Right. Okay, that's that's where I was going with that. Sorry, I misunderstood what you meant. <laughs> no, all good. Uh, speed running, I was speed running things. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> I'm working on speed running things. Speed Sorry. running, then I answer the wrong question. <laughs> no, no, it's all good. Uh, let's see. Because the question was different from what I was showing there, because the question was actually about oh, the West okay. Coast, like the entire ah, West Coast okay. gotcha. of the yes. United States, I think. Um, oh, no. Rian, thanks for being a Padrat member. Appreciate you. Musical Wolves says SpaceX just wanted to own the record for the world's largest drinking straw. Nice. <laughs> okay, appreciate you, Musical Wolves. And uh, the last one here, just clearing out the queue... Oh, wow. Oh, well, Stefan, we appreciate this. We're talking about going back to the moon and solar activity and stuff like that. I think we're going to need to go to the moon whenever we're ready to go to the moon, right? We don't typically say, oh, we're waiting another 10 years to go to the moon because the sun exists. I don't think we do that, do uh, we? No, but I know what he means. Yeah, because yeah. the increased solar cycle that yep. we're heading into the solar maximum has potential for more coronal mass ejections and charged particle and radiation elements. But in short, yep. the short answer to that is no. We're not particularly worried about that at the moment. 
Yeah. If if anything, uh, if there's increased solar activity and we need to gain more experience living and working beyond the Van Allen belts, maybe it's a good time to go. We can actually mm. get uh, more data from it that way as opposed I, I, to I, when the seas calm. And to be fair, even though you pass through the Van Allen radiation belts to go to the moon, Earth's magnetosphere, which protects us from a lot of that solar radiation, the tail of the magnetosphere, or the magneto tail, as it is called, the moon actually passes right. through that if it's on the backside. So it can kind of help you in a, in, in a bit, but if you're in it, but you know, if you're not in it, uh oh. <laughs> So a very rambling NSF Live here today, y'all. Uh, this is our show we do every Sunday. We, we, I mean, we have like a little bit of a bullet point list that's the things that we want to cover just so we don't miss anything. But a lot of times it's like 18,000 things happen at Starbase and we can't cover them all. We can't show you every one of the daily videos. So if you're really keen on what's going on at Starbase, we've got the daily videos you can watch. If you really want to know what's happening at the Cape with the, the new Starship infrastructure at the Cape, Watch for our flyover videos. Like, we have all sorts of other videos that's a different format than this that's not just us sort of rambling about topics. Hagen, you shouldn't have told me your laptop was going to die because I'm going to keep talking just until your laptop dies now. The show ends when Hagen's uh, laptop dies. It hasn't died yet. If I, if I vanish all of a sudden, then you know where I went. <laughs> Hopefully you'll just freeze with, like, a really awkward Calvin and Hobbes face. Like, or oh, something. Oh, that'd be awful. <laughs> um, but these are the shows that we do every week, y'all. We try to take some questions because it's a talk show. We get a question, and then we go off into the weeds, and, and there's speculation and opinions and stuff like that. Um, as always, we know that we don't get to all the questions, but we really do appreciate everybody who watches and chats and makes fun of us or whatever. Um, chat's now telling you that it's not healthy, healthy for the battery <laughs> to let it run all the way out, but whatever. Um, these are, are I, I'm going to ask why you're not even plugged into the wall, dude. Like, come on. I completely forgot to do it before the show. I was like, okay, I need to plug it into the wall. And well, then I forgot. So I, <laughs> last minute move, the last minute move. I got up to get a t-shirt. You could have got up to get a laptop charger. <laughs> Just like tell me in the back channel. Anyways, y'all, um, that is going to bring us to the end of NSF Live today. Yeah, no fiber and no power. You were just severely lacking cable, <laughs> sir. Um, I am just lacking on all fronts right now. <laughs> I need to give you some lessons in hardwiring things. Um, anyways, uh, that is going to bring us to the end of today's NSF Live. Uh, thank you so much for the support, y'all. All sorts of people supporting us. I'm just going to run it out till that battery dies. Uh, people doing super chat today. You're watching our daily videos or whatever. Um, letting ads roll. That lets us keep doing things. You visit the merch store and do you buy, I don't know, one of the last Starship plushies. I think we're dun, down dun, to like dun. under 40. See, this <laughs> is like an original plushie that shipped with the flaps in the stowed position. They're actually connected down, and if you want to deploy them, you can actually clip the little... Anyways, we've still got a couple Starship plushies left in the shop. If somebody can grab that, there's shop.nasaspaceflight.com. Um, down to the wire on this, we, we got like a huge number of them made. We sold out of them, and then we had some for like friends and family and stuff, and everybody got what they wanted, so we said, all right, we'll open up the last little reserve of Starship plushies. We have these as well in the shop. But however you support us, thank you so much. Um, on the show today... Hagen, thank you so much for all the information on the Decatal survey at the beginning of the show. We appreciate you there. Of course. I love talking about it. I mean, it's science. How could you not love it? So, <laughs> yeah. That was the perfect time for the battery to die. Hagen, thank you. And the screen just freezes. <laughs> Who doesn't love black screen? <laughs> yep. And also, yep. Chris Gebhardt, Assistant Managing Editor for NASA Space Flight. Chris, thank you so much as well. My pleasure as always. I can't wait to see another up close. Photo of Uranus. There you oh, go. Oh, <laughs> Excellent. And uh, let's see here. My name, I think, is John Galloway for NASA Spaceflight. You may know me as DOS. Um, we do have a lot of fun with these shows, y'all. We just load it up. If you were looking for, like, condensed news content, this ain't it. Um, if you're looking for a good time talking with space nerds about space stuff, that's sort of what we do around here. But if you haven't yet liked the video, toss a follow, like, and subscribe, whatever it is y'all are doing these days on YouTube. Um, you know how to get back here if you want to catch this sort of content in the future. Turn on the notifications, get a little ping, follow us on Twitter, at NASA Spaceflight. When we go live for a launch or whatever, we usually send out tweets as well. Um, so whatever it is, we appreciate y'all showing up and sharing this with us today. Hope you had some fun. Hope you learned something. Hope you enjoyed the drawings. Come watch the Bluebird stream <laughs> over on my Twitch channel. And we will see you nerds later. Thanks so much for watching. Thank you.
good. Calling up. Yikes. You bet. Okay. We don't need any more of these. Hey, folks, real quick, we're happy to report that Hagen has now plugged in his laptop since the show is over. Well done, Hagen. <laughs> we'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>